Um, I was looking at the the Forbes 100, uh, uh, so the BRW uh, 100 rich list, and and realised 75 percent of those people made their money through property. All right, well, Matt, firstly, before we start, love to hear a little bit more about you and uh, maybe share with us and share with the audience a little bit about um, maybe what you're currently doing in terms of your title, the things that you've done and you know, feel free to brag about all that. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Tyra. Um, not much to brag about actually but um, uh, I, I'm the Managing Director at ICD Property. Um, we're an Australian-based property development company. Um, I say Australian based, but we, we have um, projects across uh, four states in Australia. Uh, actually, I should read, correct myself. There's three states in Australia. And um, I, should, I was thinking of four projects. We've got one in Geelong. It's not a different state, unfortunately. <laughs> and we, also have, uh, we always thought it'd project. be that way. Yeah, yeah. No, I shouldn't say that either. <laughs> it's very close and very easy to access. Um, but yeah, so we've got uh, we've got uh, four projects across three states in Australia, and also a project in Auckland, New Zealand. Oh, nice. um, our projects uh, are comprise largely um, mixed use projects, um, three of which are CBD projects um, in Melbourne, Sydney, and Adelaide. Uh, in Melbourne, we've got a uh, close to six hundred apartment tower going up on King Street. In, in Melbourne CBD, and that's just starting construction now. Uh, we have a, a Sydney project, which is a, a land joint venture with the City Tattersalls Club. Oh, yes. 125-year-old, um, uh, um, 125-year-old Tattersalls Club, um, you know, big part of the community there, um, and a really centralised uh, project. It sits on... Pitt Street near Pitt Street Mall. Um, you're from Sydney, so you've done oh, that I know, well. Yes. <laughs> um, and you know, it's really exciting. We've we've achieved our stage one DA on that project, which sees us um, redeveloping the the City Tassels Club, the commercial space at sort of the uh, first few levels, and uh, within the heritage frame um, fabric as well. Excellent. And then above that, developing a boutique hotel. Um, and then above that, a residential tower. So really exciting project. Um, actually just commenced our design competition phase um, as of last week. So uh, we'll soon have a, um, you know, a, 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 um, we'll, we'll soon have an architect assigned to it as well for the tower. Very good, very good. How long has that yeah. taken to get to that stage? Because I know DA process, especially in Sydney, <laughs> is not, you know, short <laughs> to say the least. I think um, my celebrations when we get got a stage one DA probably says it all. Um, we've had the project since 2014, uh-huh. and it's gone through a number of challenges and hurdles. Um, we we actually uh, were knocked back in our first attempt uh, to get the stage one DA, um, and then worked really closely with council to um, to finally get there. Wow! Uh, yeah, wasn't a, wasn't a quick process. So. <laughs> yes, I think I totally understand. Uh, nothing, nothing's quick with council any day, <laughs> any council even to say the least. Yeah. Well, interestingly, during this um, challenging time with COVID and all, um, they've looked at uh, how they can actually expedite processes and 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 streamline. Um, and we've seen we've benefited from a bit of that already, um, especially through this stage two process usually required physical models and all that which aren't very practical <laughs> um, in the circumstances so that's been able to shorten a bit of the time frame and hopefully you know you know there's other areas which are, are questioned and challenged and uh and, and especially because we're wanting to build or bring a lot of stimulus to the economy mm-hmm. um the 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 construction industry and development industry is a big part of that. We're talking like nine, ten percent of GDP just directly through work sites. Wow. And then, you know, when you look at the flow on to other consultants and material suppliers and all that, you're you're looking at more like a, an impact of forty percent of uh, you know the economy. And and that's with you know um, looking at sort of mining materials, uh, material suppliers, uh, developers, yeah. agents. You know, it is, is a really 
wide spanning sort of impact. Yeah, I can totally understand. Well, Matt, that is very, very interesting and I can't wait to delve a little bit more into that. But before we jump into all that side of things, let's get to know you a little personally firstly, I guess. Maybe share with us in say 60 seconds or less, what's your you know, day-to-day, what do you actually do in any given day at the moment besides being at home with the kids? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's definitely taking a bigger um, part of, of the day currently. Um, look, I mean, my particular role, um, a lot of my focus is around business strategy, which is definitely ramping up a lot more um, as the, the the climate and the uncertainty into the, the near and, and medium term future. Um, but it's also supporting um, you know, with the large challenges for our delivery team. So, um, in terms of uh, assisting our development team with identifying big problems and challenges and hurdles, um, but also problem solving with them. Yeah. Um, never like to take that autonomy and, and, and management of that away from them, but being really sort of a sounding board um, in, 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 um, in dealing with those challenges. And we do that sort of as a leadership director um, group with our developer, uh, development teams, um, at least on a, on a uh, monthly basis, mm-hmm. but more frequently as the, the large challenges arise. Um, I am also a big advocate of getting involved in things that you're passionate with, um, and for me, like I, I'm, I'm, I like to get quite involved in new acquisitions and partnering as well. So, a lot of our projects, in fact, all of our projects are in some form a partnership. Um, I mentioned before with the City Tassels Club in Sydney, that's a partnership with a long joint venture there. Um, in Adelaide, I didn't get to speak about that before, but we're doing a PPP with the um, City of Adelaide there, um, and that's a redevelopment of a landmark project, this um, Central Market Arcade, uh, and, and doing it with them and with uh, Nan Shan, which is a, a, a large um, a Chinese group um, based with aluminium manufacturing, but also has a really strategic sister-type relationship with the state of Oh, that's very interesting. You mentioned the words or the, the sort of phrase PBP. What does that stand for for people who don't know what that is? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, that's a good point. A um, bit of jargon there, but uh, yeah, public-private partnership. So really working with government and um, to, to develop critical community infrastructure uh, but with a sort of a private aspect to it. Ah, oh, fantastic. Well, that sounds like a very interesting part then. The joint venturing is a strong part of it by the sounds of what you guys do. So, that would be very, very interesting to delve into a little bit more. All right. Well, let's delve into a little bit more about your story and just personally, maybe share with us just some interesting facts about your past. Where did you grow up? Uh, born and bred in Melbourne. Uh, <laughs> so, haven't moved too far from, from that. Uh, and uh, look, I've definitely um, toyed with the idea of going overseas and, and uh, working there and um, travelled a fair bit overseas but, you know, got to love Australia. <laughs> phenomenal. Um, I totally you know, agree. There's a good reason why we, as a, and a number of our cities, often get in the top 10 of most livable and um, most recognised cities. So, um, yeah, that's that's mine. Uh, I'll Went to school here as well. Uh, went to a local school, Scots College, um, for high school, and then uh, studied at Melbourne University. So, really haven't ventured too far. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to hear. We're local, born and bred too. Same, you know, Sydney as well. Oh, too. Yeah, and you moved up to Sydney. Yeah. I oh, know. I, right. I was born in Sydney, but also local. You know, local, born in Sydney and bred right. as well too. So, just like you. <laughs> so you mentioned you went to you know Melbourne University as well. What did you study there? Yeah, I studied a Bachelor of Property and Construction, um, which they, they don't have the bachelor system now. They've moved to a, um, an undergrad system, so a um, bit older. <laughs> bachelor of Property and Construction and Commerce. And then later on, I, I came back to study my Master of Applied Finance. Oh, very good. Wow, that sounds really, really interesting. So during that period of time, did you go out and gain, gain some experience before you went back to do your Master's or did you jump straight into it afterwards? Yeah, so as part of the um, property and construction course, a requirement was actually to get industry experience before you graduated. Uh, and that was really, really um, 
um, uh, really insightful, gave me a lot of understanding um, about the practical elements of my course while studying it. Mm. Um, so I actually worked at Jones Lang LaSalle um, in the research and consulting yeah. um, division that, that really helped to understand uh, the sort of macro elements that impact the property industry mm. um, as well as understanding because all of our clients were investors and developers um, what they really cared about. Yeah. So I'm really curious then, I guess that experience that you gained there, was that sort of like an internship or did they actually just hire you, you know, I guess as a project or a property developer? I don't know. What, what was the <laughs> what was the kind of term that they would have used to hire you or offer you that position? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so it, it was a kind of a mix. I was very fortunate to get a, um, a full-time role there. So I got a lot of experience and then kind of moved my final two years of um, – of uh, my studies into part time, um, and yeah, so I found that to be really valuable. Um, and so yeah, they treated me as a as a full time. Uh, I guess in the first year as a as a graduate, essentially. Yeah, that's really good. And how long were you there for? Uh, I think it was about three years in total. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's really good. You would have gained a lot of experience. What what kind of things did they actually? allow you to do like you know being such a large i guess development company because i know it's got developments it's got commercials and so forth it's it's got a broad range of you know projects going on what kind of um experience did you gain from that uh look it was it was phenomenal base um to to start with um because it it wasn't a specific um transactional role in that you know, if, you, if you're doing leasing and property management or something, you learn a lot about that particular part of property. Mm. Um, but working in research and in particular the consulting part, um, you have specific or tailored investment and development um, questions that want to be answered. Um, and they stem from everything around the, um, you know, the, 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 macro and microeconomics of property, uh, the fundamentals that drive, um, you know, property investment development decisions mm. um, all the way through to like actually doing feasibilities and understanding, you know, like, um, you know, what values are and, and, and how to make decisions from that. So it really gave me a great um, appreciation, understanding of the real world decisions in property investment and development. Yeah, I would imagine the scale of these are much, much greater than just you know the small little, maybe two or three pack kind of developments. I'm curious, like what kind of projects did you work on? Just to, as an example. Yeah, uh, one that was really interesting. It didn't actually end up going ahead um, because uh, GFC. That was that was the time. Um, uh, when I was working there, and um, it was actually a Dubai group that um, was exploring what now is um, Melbourne Quarter. That uh, there's a, a large development, sort of sits on the edge of Melbourne CBD and Docklands, <clears throat> and they had this grand vision of essentially doing a tallest tower in, in in Melbourne, and comprising of all luxury sectors of residential and retail and commercial and um, and hotel, um, and being out, be able to then um, explore the study of luxury residential. And back then, there wasn't much apartment development, even in the CBD, um, to consider. So when you're when you're doing a study, you generally trying to benchmark um, other examples. That's your sort of way of knowing is it feasible. It's like a, a value would, would look at other properties to mm. see does this stack up to what value um and it was it was really interesting because i there wasn't much around in melbourne so you kind of have to look globally um and and look at what best practice is and and take a view then of how melbourne could evolve um and you know 10 years down the track with you know sydney and melbourne you're seeing a lot of um residential development in the cbd um you know, more and more, you, uh, the apartments are coming bigger, and and you're seeing people accept luxury living and 
family living and, and mm. the same close to amenity. Um, yeah, it's it's it it's really interesting to see how you know, that practice has evolved. Totally. Yeah, that's amazing just to be a hero about that because I mean, we look back in the last decade or so, so much has changed. Even actually two decades, like Sydney itself has ha- had so many more units, so many more apartments and people moving towards that because I- I'm mm. seeing one affordability because a lot of people can't afford to just buy a block of land and you know have a house and so forth. But also two people are just so busy, you know, when they're so busy, they just don't have the time to maintain big lawns and, you know, big houses and all that. So, you know, everyone's just wanting to get closer to the city, want to, you know, have close amenities, go down to yeah. local cafes, all that kind of stuff. We're naturally lazy. I am too. <laughs> but when you have yeah. kids, it's a different story because you need a backyard, but I just don't like having to maintain the lawn. <laughs> so, no, no, no. I, I, I hear you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> or you have, have two kids is enough, you know, having to maintain the lawn and all that garden to, you know, another thing there. But yeah, I can totally understand there's just so much change. And I think as we're moving to more um, older generations where the baby boomer, they're also downsizing and we can start to see a big change for them moving into sort of townhouse slash apartment type of living as well too. It's yeah. really, really interesting. So, I guess what I wanted to just jump back to ask as well is, did you have any influence from say your parents to actually go into property development construction studies because you know, it, it, sometimes it's usually family or it's just your self-interest. How did you get involved into that? Um, t- to be honest, uh, I can't say that my parents had any influence in, in, <laughs> in, in my um, endeavors in the property and, and my endeavors in the property were probably even a little haphazard and, and um, uh, I'll, I'll explain all that. So, my, my, my parents, um, uh, my dad... Uh, has always been in investing in shares, um, not so much on the, on the property space. They, they, the only property they've ever owned is, is their house. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I never really was, was exposed too much to property investment um, from an early age. And um, funnily enough, like in high school, I actually um, I always wanted to be studying medicine and become a doctor. Yep. Um, and... Uh, I, you know, I got to year 12, didn't get the grades um, to, to get into medicine. And so I didn't really have a backup option, to be honest. I kind of was like, oh, that's what I've always wanted to do. And, and now I, I don't know what to do. Um, and, and so I kind of went at it quite logically and um, thought, well, I've got decent grades and I could probably do a double degree. And commerce and business sounds like, you know, the obvious choice. And what should I marry that with? Because, you know, uh, don't want to waste my grades. I should probably do a double degree. <laughs> um, the Asian in us, that. <laughs> that's, that's probably that's from my parents. That's a very Asian mentality. <laughs> yeah. um, and and so like I, I I thought like look I looked at all the options available to me um, and came to property and construction and went and I was like well I get that it's tangible it makes sense I can see like how I utilize it. And um, I, I think probably the thing that you know sold it for me was um, I was looking at the the Forbes 100. Uh, uh, so there's a BRW uh, 100 rich list, and and realised 75 percent of those people made their money through property. I thought, well, right. I'm not going too wrong if that you know. <laughs> and so um, I'm not saying that's the way you should pick your uh, you know, your your future careers and, and university courses. Definitely don't advocate. I'm not an advocate advocate for that, but. Um, I, I think, you know, as haphazard as it was, uh, when I got to uni, I realized I actually was really interested and really passionate about property. Mm. And I think that's how you should probably choose your university <laughs> course to do something that you're, you're passionate about. Um, but yeah, look, I, I, I think what I really love about property um, and what, what sold it for me was that tangible tangibility of it. Um, I think what I always wanted to do, do as a being a to be a doctor was that, you know, you're helping people and you can see the outcomes of it. Um, and for property, it's the same. Like mm. you turn something from something to make it better. Um, and better, like, you know, obviously my mindset but then was about making money, but <laughs> actually, you know, better is about how you influencing, how you impact in the community and those around. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's really good. And I, I wonder, have you ever reflected back to go, okay, what would happen if I actually went into 
say medical and, and got my degree and became a doctor and so forth compared to what you've done now? I wonder what the biggest difference would have been. Have you ever <laughs> thought about it? You know? Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, outside of my work at ICD, I, I do some personal developments. Um, but uh, you know, developments are quite capital intensive. So I actually do those with a couple um, uh, friends from university and, and from high school. Both of them are dentists. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess you, you don't necessarily need to have studied property or even be working in the field to get into it. Um, you know, what, what is very handy is um, as a, a in the medical field, so for those who are practitioners, um, you know, they can they have very favorable terms with the um, with financiers yeah. and borrow up to that percent. Um, that's very handy, you know, and having good cash flow um, is important. Mm. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well. I've worked with a number of developers and they always say, you know, having a doctor <laughs> as a joint venture partner is always good. So, you know, that, yeah. that's kind of, you know, the hint, hint, there's a there's a good relationship that you got to build up with them there, which is fantastic. <laughs> so, I guess between working at, um, is it JLL? Is that how we how it is? Yeah, uh, working. Yeah, sorry, Jones Lang LaSalle. It's a global um, property service firm. Yep. Yeah, a bit like CBRE and um, Knight Frank. Yep. Yep. So I guess when you finished up with it after say a three year period, where did you go from there? Yeah. So uh, I mentioned before it was GFC. So I actually was made redundant. Um, that was how I left. <laughs> um, but you know, I, another thing that I reflect on is um, the the positives. Like, the reason I mention is it's a very uncertain time for a lot of people right now. Mm. Um, people are, are losing their jobs, um, and it's it's really challenging. I think it's important to know that you know there are positives. You've got to have a positive mindset to approach every challenge, um, and you know it, it, the. Redundancy gave me an opportunity to um, reflect on the, where I was at that time. Um, what I really wanted to um, gain greater knowledge in was actually finance. Um, I felt um, I had a lot of understanding about macroeconomics and, and um, how to look at the fundamentals of property and, and how they influence um specific assets and developments, but actually going through um, uh, a development needed a great understanding of finance. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I went back and, and studied and I was fortunate enough to get a job with a bank as well um, at the time um, and navigated my way and eventually got into the property um, development and, uh, and investment lending space um, within the bank. Oh, ah, yeah. that is so cool. So you've actually started off with property development or property leasing and so forth in a large commercial space and then you went back into sort of the finance and then came you know, pretty much full circle back into property development. That would have given you an ample amount of knowledge then. Obviously, that's where you know, you've landed right now. So how long was that journey before you actually arrived to ICD? Um, I think in total about probably six to seven years uh, all up and then, um, and, and then I, 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 I um, how I actually got into ICD was so ICD property has been set up by um, a, an old school friend of mine and his family, um, the, the my family, um, and you know we would catch up when I was working at um, at ANZ um, in their in their property um, division there, and um, he wanted to understand how to navigate and approach. Uh, Finances for a, their, for ICD's first development project in mm. Collingwood, and so and I wanted to understand more from him, like how they would go about purchasing sites and developing them. So we had a you know a, a win win um, relationship, mutual relationship there, and um, beneficial relationship. And and um, one day he called me up and uh, asked me about a particular site in Melbourne CBD. And how, you know, how he would go and approach it from a financier's perspective. And so I sort of explained it, and and um, Michael then said, "Look, like I actually want you to uh, come over and, and develop this for me." Um, and that's where you know, um, that's 
you know, that was my opportunity. But at the same time, um, I'd never actively managed a development before. So I was um, in my own sort of words. I said no to, to Michael in different different language. <laughs> uh, more because I was like, look, I'm, like, I really care about you. I care about your company. I'm not, I don't want to come and, and make a mess of it. Mm. Um, but, uh, and this is, this is uh, you know, something that Michael um, has instilled in me is like, you know, you, you've got to have a lot of faith in people and their capabilities. And, um, and if you do that, like it's self-fulfilling in, in a sense. Um, and so he had a lot of trust, a lot of faith in me. He said, look, um, I think, you know, what you know as a, in your experience as a, a consultant to developers and investors and, and as a, a financier as well, um, taking all that skill and knowledge, you can apply it to development management. Um, and he was really right. Like that, that um, having that sort of rigid, not rigid framework, it, a framework, a structure to approach things. Um, uh, it was surprising that you know that was really, really efficient and useful way of developing um, or managing a project. And um, yeah, so that, that project um, ended up being an ex- extremely successful one for us. Um, it was EQ Tower project in Melbourne CBD, uh, 633 apartments. So $350 million project um, and it won multiple awards. Uh, we, we managed to secure um, a an institutional joint venture partner out of China. It was their first international project. Um, so, yeah, like from, from many angles, it was a huge success both uh, for the company and for, for myself personally. Wow, that is amazing. I mean, like that's the thing. To jump into development, 350 units and, and so forth, it, it's not a small feat, you know, to be able to build it and then also to get award recognition for a tower like that. I, I think a lot of listeners are going, wow, because a lot of them are probably just starting off with some development. Some of them might even have, you know, a, a large investment portfolio but they have to jump into that. Like, how did you guys um, enable it to, to happen? Because you're not just dealing with, you know, a few million dollars here. I'm sure you're dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars here. How did you actually put a deal together like that initially from the beginning and roughly how long did it take to actually get it to fruition to get it through DA and all that kind of stuff to happen? Yeah. So that particular project, um, uh, the the family that I, I work for, the my family, they do have a substantial amount of, of wealth. Uh, I don't think uh, myself, um, you know, personally well to do a, a large project like that. It is very capital intensive yes. and you do have to put a lot of that um, up front. And so, you know, we did have that backing behind us. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of um, milestones along the way um, that needed to be achieved. Uh, one thing that, uh, you know, was important for us was uh, the terms in which we secured the project, uh, the site. Uh, so we had an 18-month settlement terms. Uh, that enabled us to, you know, secure our DA uh, in that time frame. Uh, and in Melbourne at that time, um, we were able to secure that in five months. So that was a, a really quick process and, 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 and um, uh, really helped uh, achieve all the other outcomes. So we we're able to secure a builder um, finance from um, a local bank as well uh, for all the debt and, and our joint venture partner as well as sell out all the apartments before we even started construction. So the day we settled, we pretty much started construction. Um, so 18 months. Wow, that's pretty fast actually for for development like that. So you mentioned the joint venture partner was someone from overseas, a Chinese company. How much do you think or do you remember roughly how much they would have invested compared to say like the bank they would put the money in? Because you had obviously, you know, two parts to it. I'd say there'd be construction and there'd also be the actual purchase cost of the actual land. Mm. Yeah, I guess breaking it down to the the capital stack, um, uh, you know, you you have your equity component which – um, ICD and this joint venture partner contributed, um, and you know, thinking about it, that was you know, roughly thirty percent of the total build cost. Yep. And then the finance here, the, the bank, um, uh, the senior lender in that instance provided the, the remaining seventy percent. 
Um, but the, 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 the split was a rough, roughly a 50-50 between us and the joint venture partner. Yeah, that's really good and that's where your expertise being working in the finance industry for that period of time actually was able to help contribute towards putting this whole deal together. Is that kind of what happened? Yeah, definitely from a, I guess uh, from structuring a deal with a joint venture partner as well as knowing um, how to approach the bank um, to, to make sure we had all the information right and the project at the right stage um, to achieve the finance because it wasn't obviously it was a, a very you know large amount of debt um certain things like ensuring that all of our pre-sales or firstly our design was correct um banks don't usually support below 40 or 50 square meter apartments mm. so making sure that apartments were um structured that way with good natural light and all the other things that are important from a financier's perspective um, making sure that you know the, the sales rates were, um, you know, uh, within market range. Um, making sure that we um, had also got a good mix between local and overseas buyers as well. Um, that we you know um, contracted with a tier one builder, uh, and, and that we as ourselves and our joint venture partner were considered a strong sponsor. Um, so. You know, all those all those things are key to what a financier is um, going to look at. You know, sponsor, builder, the end sale, um, the structuring it all like that. And I think that's where I, I, I was able to bring that skill set from being a, on the financier's side to know exactly what they would consider important. Wow, that's amazing. So just curious, did you learn all that while you're actually working it? ANZ, as you mentioned, or was that something that you also developed at uni and also at JLL? Like, I guess it's it's not something you just learn out of the gate. <laughs> that sounds a bit. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, def- definitely. Theoretically, you do learn bits and pieces of it um, at, at university. Um, I practice makes you know um, perfect, and I think uh, I definitely learned a, like a 95 percent of it through work experience, mm. um, both. Uh, in terms of the feasibilities and expectations on returns um, from when I was at JLL, but in terms of the more detailed understanding of um, how to assess a good uh, project, um, how to de-risk it and all that was through through finance and through working at ANZ. Wow, amazing. All right, well, I'd love to sort of just jump into that you've also done a, a bit of property development as well too, um, you know, with some friends and so forth. But let's take a step back. Maybe let's talk about your first investment. That would be really interesting. Everyone loves to reflect back on that. Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah. Um, well, actually, uh, my, my first investment personally, um, uh, well, property development or property investment because I've done – You've done both, okay. What was your both. first? What was your first property then? <laughs> that would probably be easy, whether it be development or yeah. Oh, first, first property, probably, probably. Um, oh, f- sorry, the first property was uh, um, the apartment which my my wife and I purchased when we got married, um, and you know, like, I guess you know, the thinking about it was all right. We we want something that. Um, you know, it is in uh, with all the amenities around it that we we would use, um, and also one that we could pro- possibly see as a as an investment long term mm. once we move out into our sort of family home. Um, yeah, and 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 it's funny, like you you know, at that stage of your life, what your interests are, and, and that very much just you know um, determines what the house looks like and 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 all well, the property that you purchase and then um yeah now now like you know being in a family home like like you can never sort of see yourself in that it's a different phase of life yes um but yeah like the just trying to reflect on the the emotions of it um it's really quite daunting actually um uh we um when we liked knew we liked the property, we were very nervous to go to auction. Um, and so we 
we ended up making an offer beforehand. Um, and I think when you make offers beforehand, um, it's obviously to a point where the vendor will be satisfied. Um, it's probably also like the agents um, advising, you know, you're not going to get a better offer in, in, in an auction. So yeah. you do pay, I, in my mind, um, especially if the vendor isn't desperate, you pay sort of top dollar or, or at least sort of at market. Um, but as a buyer, I think it also you really want a property it gives you that certainty. So yeah, uh, it's uh, there's, there's pros and cons. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand. So you purchased that property that was in Melbourne CBD. How long ago was that roughly? Uh, it wasn't Melbourne City. It was actually um, at South Yarra, which oh, okay. is it's inner Melbourne. Yeah, but close, close to Mandy and stuff. That was in 2010. Great. Okay, good 10 years ago. Oh, I love South Yarra. It's a beautiful location. It's close yeah. enough to all the amenities. That's great. So, I guess as part of that um, journey because that's your first experience of buying property personally, you've worked in finance, you've done a bit of development and so forth. What happened after that? When did, at what stage did you jump into property development for yourself personally, I should say? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I was already working at ICD um, probably a couple of years. Um, my first... Uh, personal development actually came through one of my friends who was already doing development and um, he wanted to partner to um, explore, you know, more complicated types of development than just um, uh, the simple townhouse, which he, he was doing a fair bit of. Um, and so I came on board and we explored it and did a whole bunch of feasibilities and other considerations and ultimately I we, we landed at the um, conclusion that we could do all that but actually doing the townhouses, the simple um, form was going to be easier to secure finance, um, lower risk to sell, uh, lower risk and less capital to develop, to build um, and the returns were actually stronger as well. Mm. So I was like, look, I get you want to do this. Maybe you're kind of bored of doing the simple stuff, um, but actually it looks like doing the simple stuff is better for you on many perspectives. Um, and uh, that, that started our relationship in doing um, a partnership to do developments together. And you know, we've now done four or five um, of those simple type of townhouses. And it's just, it's just a good one to have on the side. Um, I get probably a little bit more involved in design elements and stuff, whereas in ICD, you know, we've got um, architects who are the expert at, ex- experts in that and you've got yes. a lot of other helping hands. So, Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating because I think at the end of the day, it's all part of what you've been doing because you've got a, a strong background knowledge at working at ICD that you can take away into your personal side of things. And I guess it depends on the capital, you know, the risk and so forth. And I got to admit, you know, the simple ones are usually the most profitable ones from what I hear and gather because I think people just get like if you've been doing the same thing over and over again, people think, yeah, it, you know, you're doing really well but you, you want to change and I think sometimes when you get away from that, you kind of lose focus and then it ends up, you know, getting worse off. So, I think when you said that the simple ones are the best, um, it kind of just hits a really, really important foundation that, you know, if it's working improve it but you know why change it you know drastically change into something different just mm. curious how many i guess how, how many townhouses were you developing with with your partner there yeah so most most of the sites the projects are generally about three to five townhouses mm. so really simple we're talking about buying a, a, a um a residential block you know um typically 700 plus square meters um Corners are the best, and and, and usually um, north facing with a sort of a, a um, vertical directional, if that makes sense. But yes, yep. uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously, it depends on the the, the, the zoning and then planning um, uh, restrictions in, in on, on a particular site. But yeah, generally, that's the sort of size. Yeah, well, 700 square meters is, is a really small size. Um, how many can you actually get fit on there? And I guess it depends on the council too, but how many usually you can fit on a, a block like that? Yeah, so we've, we've, we've fit between um, three to five. Wow, that's pretty good. 
I mean, like, you know, if you get a 700 square meter block in, in Sydney, most of the time, depending on which council, most you could do is a duplex. They wouldn't even allow you to even build that many on there, which is really yeah. interesting. So, I guess it's depending on the council, depending on location. Yeah, and, it, and even in the short time that I've been developing, um, yeah, the, the, the councils have changed their, their regulations. Um, so, you do find that what you possibly could have done a few years ago um, is, is you know, probably not possible now. Mm. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's around trying to restrict the, um, the density in, in some of the suburbs. So, yep. yeah. <laughs> totally understand. I guess um, you've been through a journey, you've worked with ICD. Maybe share with us a story perhaps, you know, with the properties that you've done. Have you had any sort of worst case or worst investing moments or worst developing moments? Any stories you can share about that? Lessons we can learn from, I guess. Um, yeah, look, I think, uh, well, a big risk for a lot of smaller developments um, and look, there's actually a risk for any development um, is around the builder. Oh. Um, so we, we've actually had a builder fall over on one of our projects mm. um, and we're still completing that project now, <laughs> <laughs> um, probably, probably a year after we would like to have completed it. Um, so that has, you know, a real material impact on, on your outcomes. Mm. Um and sort of reflecting on, you know, um, reflecting on how we could have mitigated against that. Um, I think it's really important to do greater assessment on borders that you're looking to engage. Um, and I think, you know, making sure you understand their financial capacity um, and cash flow uh, that you know builders rely heavily on on cash flow and when they um, are in trouble they start to turn the tap off on their subcontractors uh, and then you get issues there so um, digging into that whether you're asking the subcontractors whether, whether um, you're looking up for any um, court or um, uh, in, you know um, uh, Claims you know, against against the builder yeah. um, online, uh, and understanding how much work they've got on. Um, a lot of builders um, that go broke uh, are generally ones that are looking to grow really quickly. Ah, uh, okay. Not too much. They have too much debt. Yes, yes. I Those who want to keep doing the same thing as we talked about before, like it's hard to stuff up something you know really well. That exactly right. It's really interesting because when you say that, it's the same thing with I guess developers and any business to be honest, any business that grows so fast, either trying to get more capital, trying to get more funding is a challenge and as soon as they do get that, they're going to spend and burn that cash very quickly because they want to expand very, very quickly too which mm. is yeah, very, very much of a, a big topic there. I'm also curious then if you take a step back at when you chose this builder, what were the things that you found that this was going to be sort of builder because obviously you would have had a few other builders to choose from why did you choose this particular one and you know from that period of time you realize okay things were not working out share with us how that happened yeah look i think um uh that we probably prioritized um as an investment prioritized price but also prioritized like just got a gut feel that they, they seem like a good builder. They're very organized, very structured, um, but probably didn't ask the right questions or we didn't ask the right questions around the capacity and any sort of uh, bubbling issues going on in, 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 the, in the company. Mm, okay, that's that's fair. Yeah, and that, that sometimes I guess happens when we're going through the whole process as well. Due diligence, you know, we try our best, but sometimes just, you know, it doesn't hit yeah. the mark. On the flip side of things, it seemed like on the face of it, I think people can dress things up really nicely. Um, it seems okay, but yeah, you do need to dig in further. Yeah, and it's funny because when I think about my personal experience, it's like that with a few properties I've looked at. On the front end facade, it looks great, but once you start doing building inspection report and you go inside and find that there's termites, there's water damage, all that kind of stuff only comes out through further due diligence. And you won't even know until you actually start renovating the property because then it opens up a can of worms. So, 
yeah, it's interesting yeah. when we discover that. I guess on the flip side, I'm, I'm curious to know as well, during your whole journey of developing and investing and so forth, where do you think or do you remember a time you had an amazing aha moment that everything just clicked for you? Um, I guess um, and I'm sorry if I'm recycling examples here but uh, it's okay. um, for me, I had a lot of doubt in my capabilities um, going into ICD and um, you know, when we were able to secure that joint venture partner, um, you know, an in institutional group and, you know, a $30 billion company based out of China um, listed in, on the stock exchange there to invest in our project that I was managing, um, it, to me, gave a lot of val validity that, you know, I'm doing something okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, for, I think the lesson I learned from that is um, there's no right or wrong way to, to developing projects. Um, you, I guess you just have to find your own logic and make sure that, you know, your fundamentals make sense. Um, for me, I drew a lot on how a financier would approach a, a property development. Um, I also, where I didn't know what was the best way of doing things, I, I benchmarked the best um, out there. So I looked at what other people were doing globally, locally, um, and I was like, well, if they did it and it works, then, hmm. yeah, copy it. Yeah. There's, there's, why, uh, why reinvent the wheel when it's out there already? Correct. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. It, it's it's amazing because I think if you look at the fundamentals and the foundations of property development, the principles are very much the same, just different scales of things that go on and lots of different complexities because say doing a, a smaller development, three to five townhouses, as you said, it's simple, you know, it knows it works, you tick it over. But once you start mm. building say 350 apartments, things get a little bit more hairy, I guess you can say. <laughs> So, yeah. I guess what I'm just trying to portray to the audience is what have you learned, I guess, putting these kind of bigger, larger property developments together that you can impart to people because I'm sure that there are a lot of people who want to go and develop these larger apartments and want to, you know, do those kind of bigger things. What do you think you can impart to listeners about that? Um, I, I think when you're making very and, and it doesn't matter what scale it is because even even sometimes the individual smaller projects you're talking big capital um for anyone um for myself included the the, the big decisions and you, you um it's it's easy to focus on the downside um the you know, what if and the um the negative rhetoric that goes with that and um it's often that which really holds you back from making um, crucial decisions and, and sort of helping you propel forward. Um, I think something I learned from both Michael, who, who's, who's my boss, and, and his father, who's had a lot of experience um, running a large company, um, he said, look, you, you can't mitigate or, sorry, you, you can't get rid of all risks. Otherwise, you might as well just, you know, put your money in the bank or wherever else you can possibly make some, you know, risk-free money. Yes. But if you can satisfy yourself that you're comfortable with the worst-case scenario, the exit strategy, call it, um, if things don't work out with your decision, um, then you can sleep at night. Mm. So... If you know that, okay, I'm going to buy this site and I'm going to develop it. But if, you know, the feasibility doesn't stack up or the market turns or whatever it is, I can sell this site and possibly lose $100,000 or $200,000. Then, you know, you're, and you can live with that. Yeah. Then, then you can, you remove the stress. And I think that's a, a critical part about making decisions. Um, and and sleeping at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to get a good night's sleep, especially when things <laughs> don't go well. 
it's it's really interesting because the principles and the I guess the mindset as you've just said it's it's very similar to any scale as you said um, where you got to be able to figure out okay what's your worst case scenario how to mitigate that risk and if you're okay with mitigating that risk then you move forward on and I mm. guess it's it's looking at all those different scenarios and feasibilities and so forth. Like, do you guys have sort of a, a framework on how many scenarios that you run through to to ensure that you know you get to a certain stage that okay, and, and, and there must be a lot more approval process, I assume, because we're doing it with larger scale things. Can you sort of explain how that process and that thinking goes behind it as well? Yeah, um, definitely. It's it's worth having more than one scenario. I think like if you think that everything's going to go this way, then um, you're going to be in for a rude shock. Um, but yeah, generally we'll run probably three scenarios, um, a, a, a base case, a target and a, and a, and a worst case or stress case um, and uh, really focuses more on the base and the, and, the, and, the, and the stress, you know, like what do we want to achieve and see as realistically possible and, you know, what if we get delays or things cost more than they should and all that sort of stuff and, mm-hmm. um yeah, so that's, that's a process and then, and then really our decisions would be based on like, you know, what's the return we're getting in the base case? Yep, we're satisfied with that. Um, like that, that's a good use of our money. And then the stress case is like, okay, what's going to happen if, you know, worst case scenario, are we going to lose money? Are we going to have enough money? You know, all those sort of um, considerations and then we're, we're comfortable with that and have the mitigants in place to ensure that, um, you know that that is the worst case that's going to happen, but also less likely than than it could if we didn't mitigate against it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So let's talk about I guess projects that you're currently working on um, at this point in time. You mentioned there's one that's down at Pitt Street. You've got you know one in in New Zealand. You've got another one uh, over in Geelong and so forth. So you guys are, are spread across, you know, a few different projects at the moment. Which tell maybe just pick one, I guess. Tell us a little bit about what is happening in that project and how I guess wanted to sort of cover on the current environment in the state. How you guys are sort of managing that because this is completely unforeseen circumstances. And you know, you would have planned out for both the worst and also the best case scenarios. How is it impacting these projects or that project that you could talk about? Yeah, um, it's a good one. I'll, I'll probably use the most, uh, not controversial, but one that I think has um, been impacted the most um, from this. And I would say that uh, our Adelaide project, um, because we in the very early phases of, of that, um, it, it's good and it's bad. I wouldn't say bad even. It's, it's, it's good in that we haven't got everything rigidly in place. Um, it's going. It's a development of 16,000 square metres of office. It's um, close to 10,000 square metres of retail space. It's got a hotel in there and, and it's got residential as well. So if, if I was to say like um, if we're completing that project now in the state of the market, mm. retail is shot, office has got you know, um, challenges in the horizon, Hotel hasn't been operating for you know <laughs> across the, the world, and and I think the latest reports on international tra- travel is going to be um, not um, you know back to normal until 2023. So um, there are a lot of headwinds for a project like that that's in design, in the sense that we need to consider and and um, and work within a very uncertain framework of what is office going to look like at the end of this, like. Has is the new normal um, meaning that people don't work in office spaces anymore? I, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. But like you know, like h- how much is it going to change, and how do we build into that? Um, and we've done part of that by restructuring the way the office is designed. So we were originally going to have two towers. Now we're, we're combining them with a central core, which enables you to have two separate areas still so you can there's a lot of flexibility in the size of the spaces um or we could have a, a large contiguous space of you know two and a half that two two thousand two and a half thousand square meters so oh. like it, you know that that's one element of it um i guess with the, the office as well like you know um in this challenging time we want to create positivity 
and we'd like to work with you know the government and the various bodies to potentially firm up demand in that. So I know that there's a number of government um, departments as well as um, uh, an ancillary sort of groups associated with the government that are looking for space. They want this development to um, go up and go up quickly. That's another way of sort of supporting it. So um, looking into those areas for office, yep. for retail, now retail is a big one, you know, like, oh, yeah. you know, everyone's now gotten used to online. Um, how does that change the retail space? And I think um, it was already heading in that direction, just probably a bit slower than it has now. Um, so I think the fundamental about retail is really making an interactive entertainment focused space. Oh, um, oh, yes. You know, like it's not just about buying your goods because if you can buy your goods, you've got a supplementary source for that now. Mm. Um, so how do you make it something that is not replaceable through through online, online. such as cafes, restaurants, all those kind of things that um, people can only go out to dine. Yes, you can have it at home but you know that entertainment as you said, cinemas but you still got to go and buy groceries so the supermarket probably yeah. comes into play. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually very interesting that you talk about that. Did, you, did it also shift the idea to maybe perhaps switch some of it to residential to build units on top and you know all those kinds of things or has it only been sewn for complete commercial and office space? Oh no, sorry. That 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 project also has residential. Oh, children oh as well. okay, okay. Yeah. I didn't met, didn't. Yeah, wasn't sure that you had that. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, so it does have um, circa sort of three hundred apartments in there. Gotcha. Um, and uh, you know, like that, that's another area to really explore as well. Um, there's a sort of rising trend towards build to rent mm. um, type development. So, you know, in terms of um, mitigating potential residential sales oh. risk. Could you look at, at, at in one line and um, the focus on build to rent is around yield and yields are stronger in Adelaide than they would be in Sydney and Melbourne mm. uh, with the lot prices. So that's another thing to sort of explore. And, and all these things, there's as you can start to see with a, a, a more complex project, a large project like this, there's a, a lot of things to consider in the current environment. For sure. It makes me ask the question is how do you manage all this? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, well, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it, it's, a team is definitely, I agree, is, is really important but then how do you know what are your big blocks to focus because it sounds like you know quite a lot about the project itself, you know, the details behind it, the inner workings of it, you know, like how do you ensure that um, I guess you're, you're being the managing director to deliver on the things that are set in goals but at the same time to empower your team to complete the things that you need to be done mm. um it's probably the other way around actually in that like the team is they we've set up a a, a system where the, the team has full empowerment and it's then up for them to come to us when they need support mm. and I've, I've um because we are in regular um touch points i, as I say we like a, me and, and the leadership team um we, we get regular updates from the guys on things that matter. Um, they leave us out on the very specific details that are going on, but um, we get to understand the, um, the key drivers, the things that are um, fundamentally going to impact the value of a project. Um, and, and that's probably like a good lesson learned for those out there and is that um, you can focus on the color of a tap or, you know, like um, a, um, a something minute or small like that, yeah. you know, a tile that's $30 versus another tile that's $28 or something like that. But um, if you take a step back and look at things that are going to make more difference, um, uh, one, they're more fulfilling, I think, and you don't get so bogged down. Um yeah, and, and they're obviously going to make a, a greater impact. So it might seem like I know a lot about the project. I think if you ask me the nth details of things, I'd be I would struggle for sure. Um, but in terms of going back to your question, managing it, um, yeah, like having good people around you that you can trust is key. Yeah, I love that. That's that's a really really great takeaway from that. And um, I guess because 
your your company and the people that you're managing, you are dealing with larger scale projects. So it's just really, really interesting to hear the insights behind it. Uh, okay, well, I guess I want to delve into more mindset now since we kind of have already touched about it. What's been mm. your biggest why? Why you're doing this? What is it that you're trying to achieve for not only just your family and yourself, but also for ICD? Yeah. Um, and that's it's it's funny that you mentioned family and 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 myself and um, uh, I can't say that I, I I started off with the why at the very start of of working at ICD, but it's definitely evolved, especially now in a in this leadership role um, at ICD. I've realised the importance of why um, why drives everything. Like if if you don't have a reason a, 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 of doing what you do, you you fizzle and burn out. Um, because you won't have that drive. Uh, if I was to sum it up in, in one sentence as a personal why, um, for me, like I want to do stuff that's going to um, make my my kids proud of, of of what their dad's been able to achieve, mm-hmm. um, and you know, having that really deep, meaningful reason for for doing something, I think is is really important, and. Um, Sharing that with the team, uh, like I, I realized that it's it's not an isolated thing. Everyone um, that works at ICD has a really deep, purposeful reason um, for developing what we do, and we our so we we don't want to develop things purely just to make money. Mm. Um, that's an important aspect as a. As a commercial as a, as a corporation. Um, but we've actually got a, a motto. That, you know, we, we want to develop buildings that stand the test of time, beautiful buildings that stand the test of time. Um, what that really speaks to and, and captures for all of us is this idea of, um, of passion. You know, you're doing something you're passionate about. Um, it's developing that st- sustainability um, from an investment perspective. Uh, from a community perspective, so you're de- delivering an a, an end product that you know is good f- for the people you're developing for. So you that feeling of yep, I've done something good for the community. I've done something good for our purchasers. Um, we're not shortchanging them. They're going to get a great investment themselves. They're going to get great enjoyment out of the the pro- product that we've created for them, uh, and for our staff as a stakeholder themselves. Um, you know, that sense of pride. Mm. We developed a landmark project that I can be proud of, that I can showcase to my family and friends and say, I was involved in that. Um, yeah, that, that's that's the why. That is amazing just to be able to hear that because you don't get to hear enough of that just in, in general, you know, around there because that impacts a lot of things that you do and you have that strong impact. It influences not just only staff but people around you, the stakeholders even just buyers as well and it just inspires you to go, wow, you know, I want to be part of a great thing like that and, and that's probably the reason why your first project was so successful in you know, building up those apartments and so forth in the heart of Melbourne as well. I'm curious as well, over the period of time, I'm pretty sure you've been spending a lot of time on personal development as you mentioned earlier. Have you got any resources or mentors that you could share with us that has helped you along the way? Yeah, sure. Um Probably the, the 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 I don't read too much. I can't give you <laughs> audio <laughs> books. Good for me too, or video. <laughs> that, that's fun. It's funny though. Yeah, yeah. Audio podcasts are great, and I'll, I'll, um and uh, so, but uh, there is one book uh, I would say, um, and it's not even a property book. It's Ben Graham's, um, you know, Intelligent Investor. Um, what I learned from that was, and that's a, that's a that's a book that Warren Buffett of, often refers to, and I think Warren Buffett is probably a um, uh, you know, an important influencer in the way I go about looking at investments. Um, one thing is, and this is why I don't go into shares, <laughs> is, is understand what you invest in. You know, like know to the core, the fundamentals of what you're investing and, and that it makes sense to you. Yep. Um, and any time I've lost money is investing in shares off people's recommendations. So uh, <laughs> that's, 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 that, that to me is... Fun, you know, really important. Know what you're investing in, yep. um, and making sure that you're investing in good value. You know, mm. Buy at the right time and the right property, 
um, you know, that, that, that they're cool. Um, but outside of, outside of reading, like, um, you know, podcasts, uh, and I, I, I prescribe that to mine are mainly, mainly around leadership, um, rather than so much on the property side of things. Um, but Entree Leadership as a, as a podcast has been really, um, useful for me. Um, and that's more around, uh, actually interactions with and, and leading staff. Um, because as I mentioned before, like how do you manage all of this? It's actually for me now and the way I go about running um, it, the businesses is around um, how I interact and influence staff and influence consultants and stuff, which I guess for on a smaller scale is still important, like treat people well yeah. and you'll, you know, you'll be rewarded with um, – you know, uh, with dedication, loyalty, uh, and, and results. Um, and I think, you know, structuring things, um, to do that you know, is, is key. So yeah, entree leadership is one, um, we've actually at, at work, we've, um, aligned with a, a group called performance shift, uh, Kirk Peterson, uh, he comes in and, and, um, again, it's more around self management and team, interaction and management than, than anything else um from a property side of things um uh like i i look up to to michael who's my boss and um and his father as well um who, who runs a, a like a, a conglomerate that has a large property component in it well and really understands the fundamentals around property on a global scale um and you know, there are some really wise people outside in, in the property industry. Um, one is the head of EG Funds Management, mm. Adam Gutt. Um Every time I talk to him, I think I get wiser. So, um, <laughs> Rob, Rob, he's, you know, here and just trying to get that little extra glimpse of wise wisdom through. <laughs> That's it. And then there's other people in the, that I've, you know, come across. My ex-boss at ANZ, I still keep in touch with him a lot, Adrian Blake. Um, yeah, he, he's phenomenal in, in, in knowing the, the, the property industry and, and, and the trends and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think like whenever you find people that really inspire you and, 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 um, and uh, motivate you and also give you great insight, you got to hold on to those people. Yeah, totally. I, I love what you're sharing because leadership just doesn't necessarily apply in big scale things or large corporations, but it actually can apply anywhere, whether it be a family, at home, whether it be you know in a small little development. Even when you're working in, in just buying property, you're, you're dealing with people as well too because you're going to have to deal with agents, you're going to have to deal with solicitors and so forth and in order to get the end result, you've got to be able to lead well to be able to get that end result and what you want to achieve. Otherwise, they can just take you for a run, so which is not what yeah. we want. So it's it's really really powerful what you've said there, and I really really resonate with that too. Okay, I love to look at hindsight. I love to find out from you if you met yourself say ten years ago, what do you think you would have said to him? Oh well, um, so yeah, look, ten years ago I would have probably been smack bang on you know when I got made redundant. So that would be perfect timing to to impart some wisdom um just you know uh, the positive attitude is very important in life um you can look at anything half full or half empty mm. um and you will achieve a lot more if you're positive about any situation at all yeah um so i, I guess it's sort of a, a guiding point i would i would say that um to my for myself, um, I also feel like I got into property development on my own, on my own part um, a lot later. I, I definitely thought about it earlier, uh, sort of around ten years ago, but never took the dive into it. It took a friend of mine to, you know, influence and persuade me into it. Um, but if I was able to to speak to my former self, I would say just just give it a go. Like you know, the worst thing that can happen is you lose your money and you get a really good lesson in life. <laughs> 
Oh, that's great. Honestly. Oh, the outcome, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, if you start 10 years earlier, y- yeah, you can make mistakes much earlier and obviously, you know, things would be slightly a bit different then. But that that is amazing. Just insight in there. What's interesting as well, you mentioned back in 2010 was when you first purchased your first property, which is that apartment, right? Mm, so, yeah. that was around that same time. Was it? Did you yeah, purchase- I can't remember how, what the timing was, whether it was before or after. Um, I, I have a feeling I got made redundant before, got a new job. And then purchased the property, yeah, because it was late late 2010 uh, when we got made, purchased the property in Santa. But uh, yeah, the, yeah, that's, yeah, I think like yeah, I recovered pretty quickly out of that's it. That's what I was going <laughs> to say. Everything fell into place, worked out really well. So looking in hindsight, you tell yourself ten years ago, look, you know, things worked out extremely well. <laughs> yeah, excellent. And looking to the future, what do you think you're most excited about in the say next five years or so? Um, well, we um, last year and the, yeah, pretty much last year picked up all these amazing projects. The one in LA, the one in um, oh, we, we were able to get approval for Sydney. Picked up our Auckland project. I'm really excited to be doing those projects, and over the next five years, that's what's going to come to fruition. Uh, as well as the one in Melbourne, which will be completed over that time. Um, and yeah, and we're really excited about. Um, you know, what's in store for us in the next year or two. There's a lot of uncertainty, but, um, you know, I think once we are uh, um, settled down on these other big projects, like I'm really keen for our, our team to be purchasing and, 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 and getting involved in more projects. So, yeah. Fantastic. That, that, well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. It's just so exciting to see what you guys are doing and, and especially, you know, in the times right now, it's you either sink or swim and I think this is the time that, you know, you'll start to see a lot of great opportunities come out as well. Last question for you is how much of your success is due to your skill, intelligence and hard work and how much of it is because of luck? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Um Probably, <laughs> so, well, that's a good question. Um, like, I, again, I'm a dad. I don't, skill, I don't think of myself as very skillful, um, mainly hard work. Now, look, I, 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 my, my thinking around luck is, you know, you make your own luck. You've got opportunities. Everyone's got opportunities in their life. Um, it's what you make out of them. Yeah. So, um, like, if you want to call that luck, like something just drops in front of you, you've got to pick it up. And um, so I would say, you know, 90% hard work um, and don't see hard work as a negative either. Like the hard work is enjoyable when you get an outcome. So, uh, yeah, I think that and then, yeah, 5 10% skill. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for coming onto the podcast today. If listeners want to reach out to you to find out a bit more about what you're currently doing, just to connect with you, ask any further questions, how can they connect with you? Sure. Um, well, you can view all of ICD's, uh, ICD Properties projects on and the latest news about us on our website, which is www.icdproperty.com.au. Um, also on LinkedIn, uh, ICD Property, as well as our Instagram, which is at ICD Property. Fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on today. I really, really enjoyed our conversation, our chat and I'm looking forward to you know keeping in touch just to find out what, what else is going to be happening in the future as well. So, thank you so much again. Likewise. Thanks a lot, Tyrone. Take care.